Why do whales sing? This is something scientists are still trying to figure out. They don't know. My sense is that one reason whales sing is to transmute energy through the waters. I once read a book about Lemuria that said whales and dolphins maintained energetic temples underwater at one time. Maybe they still sing as a spiritual practice. What I do know is that lakes, rivers, and oceans are the lifeblood of the earth. In 2020, after the world slowed down because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I felt a strong sense of knowing that we, those who are called, like me and my guest on this episode, Michaela Harrison, should sing sweet songs to the water because healing energy can be transmitted to all life through our waterways. Michaela A. Harrison is a spirit woman, a priest, healer, international citizen, dreamer, and professor of Africana studies who turned to a full-time pursuit of music while living in New Orleans. She is using her music in a healing way to communicate with whales, as, and they are responding to her. Michaela shares a message from the whales near Bahia, Brazil, and much more on this episode. Stay tuned. Special note, this episode may have a few glitches in it. You may hear a few glitches, and I ask that you would kindly overlook them. I had some technical difficulties with this interview, and I had thought I was going to scrap it, and then we were going to re-record, and that didn't work out. And then the day after we were supposed to record, I woke up with this knowing that I should release the episode as it is. So that's what I'm doing. Please enjoy. So how did music become such an integral part of your life? Well, I mean, it's always been integral. You know, I definitely grew up with music. My parents played a lot of music in the house and I um, started singing in church very young. I think I was four when I joined gospel choir. So it's always been integral and I've always understood music to be um, a central part of my life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, as far as doing it professionally, I, I really think that came, I mean, I did it professionally sort of as a side thing um, for many years from my 20s on. But in terms of really giving myself to music as my main career, that didn't happen until I moved to New Orleans um, in the early 2000s. And I, I taught at Dillard University the first year that I was there. I taught African World Studies. I also have a master's in Africana Studies. And so I went to New Orleans teaching African World Studies at Dillard. And after a year... I love teaching, but after a year, I realized, uh, you know, being in that environment of so much music and people like making their living, making music and it being a really loving, receptive community rather than competitive as it was in the places I had lived before. I knew that it was time for me to just give myself to the music. Really? I was raised with music in the house, too. I feel like it's wonderful as a part of ritual. Now, how do you use music as a part of ritual? I know you have um, something called the healing room. Is that is that where you can integrate ritual, or how do you tell us about the healing room? And I definitely want to play the song that you all do called the healing room. I just love that song. I played that song like like twenty times. Like this oh. is my new jam. <laughs> oh yay! Um, well, the healing room is a song. You know, it started as the inspiration really for the song was I was living in New Orleans and just a lot of young black men and black boys um, being killed and injured in violence and, you know, police brutality incidents. And so that was the initial spark for the song, which evolved into a piece that is basically like 
a song I sing to myself. You know, most of the songs I write are songs I sing to myself to remind myself or encourage myself. And for Black folks in particular, you know, looking at our ancestry and this history of, of trauma that we have. And, and then for, in general, anyone who finds themselves in need of healing. And it kind of became my anthem, you know, as I started to perform it regularly in New Orleans. And then it evolved into sort of the defining theme for the performance spaces that I was creating, which are ritual spaces in the sense, not in terms of formal ritual, but in terms of gathering people together to heal with music. And they always involve collective singing. They always involve, um, you know, an opportunity for folks to lay down whatever burdens they came in with. They always involve the elevation of love as our salvation, you know, and vibration as a really powerful tool for shifting energy. So I started to have regular weekly gigs in New Orleans and referring to them as the healing room and moving different places, doing different performances Calling, called The Healing Room, with the repertoire being chosen specifically with the intention of bringing the healing energy through. So that's the gist of it. Wow, that is so wonderful. I, you know, the thing that I always loved about the Black church is is the congregational songs. And and I, I love the way you're integrating our traditions, the African-American traditions, in your in your work in African traditions in your work because because a lot of the the practices that we have we can we can see evidence of them coming from Africa like the the call and response and you know collective Definitely. hymns so I love that you're that you're doing that I I have heard of people who have done work with the ocean but I've not heard of a black person doing. Um, work with the ocean. Tell me what happened in, in 2018? What was the pivotal shift in you that made you want to sing on the ocean with and for the whales? Um, well, it was, it was encountering the whales. You know, I had, I had heard whale song many years prior as a teenager for the first time. And from the first time I heard whale song, I, uh, something in me was like a ping, you know, it was like, oh, that's for me. There's something in that for me. And so I stored it away for a future time, but I knew at some point I was going to do something with the whales and whale song. And I started coming here to the place where I am now, Playa del Fonte Bahia, to perform at a space um, called Projeto Tamar which is a sea turtle reserve, but they also have um, a musical component. And so they have regular performances as one of the ways that they support that project. A beautiful stage overlooking the sea is my favorite stage. And so I started performing there. And in this region, this is also where the whales come to give birth annually. Mm -hmm. They migrate here from Antarctica to give birth um, in this part of Bahia, in Bahia in general. And so I discovered that they had whale watching tours here. And I mentioned to the director of the Sea Turtle Reserve that I really wanted to go see the whales, you know, and I had this crazy dream of at some point singing with the whales, doing something with the whales. So he arranged for me to go out on um, the whale watching boat. And from the first, from the second I saw the whales, I just was so overcome with emotion, just so powerfully moved by their presence and their energy. They're just sublime beings, you know, and anyone who's been in their presence knows that, you know. And so I just started to sing, you know, just in the moment from the boat, I started to sing and I sang Wait in the Water. I sang spirituals when I first encountered them. And they came over to the boat and they danced and they made it very clear that they got it, you know, that they 
felt the music, they were moving to it, that they wanted this connection. And it was a healing for everybody who was on the boat. Like nobody knew that that was going to happen, you know, and I didn't know anybody else on the boat, but everybody had this very transformative experience from that moment, you know, and that's when I knew, oh, this is something that I have to do. This is time for this to be a real thing, you know, because I was there with strangers and I knew what I was experiencing, but I mean, people were crying. Like it was, it was very, like we were in the middle of the ocean, all these strangers, like maybe 35, 40 people on the boat, you know, having this collective healing experience that was just spontaneously inspired by the presence of the whales, you know, and that's when I knew that it was time to do this. And so, um, it turns out that the brother of the director of the Turtle Reserve is the vice president of the Humpback Whale Institute, which is down the street. And so, um, you know, he connected us and he was like, you want to sing with the whales? When do we make it happen? Let's do it. And so I kind of like literally the whole infrastructure to make this crazy dream a reality fell into my lap. Like I went nowhere looking for it. You know, it literally came to me. So um, it was very clear that it was something that I was supposed to do. What part of yourself um, is present with this in this project? I mean, what parts of yourself or I guess I really want like to know how are you different? So if you were to to look at Michaela in 2017, and Michaela now, how have you changed? How has your spirit changed? How has your work changed? How has your focus changed? Um, well, as incredible as it is to say this, I'm even wilder than I was before. <laughs> I've always been pretty wild, as anybody who knows me could tell you. Definitely more committed to, you know, the preservation of our oceans and our waters and using my voice to um, to promote that preservation and that healing, using my talents and my energy for that. Um, more and more understanding of myself as a marine creature, truly more connected to myself as a being of the universe. I've always been very connected to the stars and outer space and all of that. And this, you know, the whales definitely are in that conversation with the stars. And so, um, like, even deeper into that connectedness and, and feeling the expansiveness of my being as something that I experience in my consciousness in the day to day, you know, um, I've always been an animal whisperer. That's always been a part of my journey. Um, this has shifted my understanding of that. That's always been sort of like a private thing or something that I do in my intimate spaces and people who know me know, but now it's something that is, um, part of my public presence, you know, and I've come to understand that it needs to be an integral part of my public presentations from this point forward as we human beings grapple with our relationship to nature and the ways that nature is adjusting to our presence and our um, impact. Um, that that needs to be more and more forward in my work. And so this work with the whales has definitely given me uh, an understanding of that being a much bigger scope than I had initially thought, you know, because I'm now, it's like the birds and, you know, all the animals, like I'm, I'm understanding different ways to incorporate that into what I share creatively. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, hadn't, thought of myself as a whisperer. However, recently I was singing and playing the singing bowls at the at the riverfront and this duck announced itself, walked closer and closer and closer to me. The 
I was walking and then singing and the same duck came and he danced on the water and yes. raised his wings to say, I'm yes. here, I hear you. Yes. Yeah. It, so that's why I'm like, yes, I can so relate to, yes. to what you're doing. I think that, that there definitely is a healing for human beings and for um, animals when we can find a common ground. Absolutely. And music is that, it's the universal language. It's like it is the universal language and i mean universal in the literal sense you know the stars the planets if you look at the mathematics it's all music you know all the um ellipses and the revolutions and the trajectories and it's all music it's all music it's all music you know mm -hmm. and not only is it healing for us and for the animals, it's also healing for the plants and the waters and, you know, the soil. And it is, it is something that we can tap into that is beyond, um, you know, political and social movements, which are great. Uh, but it is something that is always a power in our hands that we have access to at any moment to call upon to shift the vibration wherever we find ourselves. You know? Yes, I love that. You know, I've, I've been an environmental, act, I've worked as an environmental, at an environmental activist organization, and I've worked in environmental organizations. And I, I feel at this point, having been through the, polit the politics of the nonprofit world, that it's more direct for me to just go and sing. You know, recently, well, last year, I went to a community meeting and I invited the community to write some positive messages for the earth that that we could put back into the earth just as we are uh, putting so many toxins into the soil and and we are sometimes we have our our difficult emotions that that can be transmuted through the earth the earth also needs love and also needs our positive energy and I was really surprised that that basically pretty much everyone gave me a message for the earth and then I went and did a, a ritual to to bury the, the messages and, and give them to the earth. I think that's a more direct, less frustrating route for me anyway than working mm -hmm. with a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I think everybody has their path, you know, and we need it all to be happening now, you know. So some people are pulled to work in the nonprofit arena. Some people are, you know, called to be political organizers. Some people are called to be activists. Some people are called to sing to the whales and to sing to the earth and to, you know, dance on the earth. And, you know, all of it, like, it's definitely we're at the point where we need to pull out all the stops. So whatever it is that you feel moved to contribute and to offer to shift this, like everybody needs to be doing that right now and it's all valid and it's all powerful. And I have the pleasure of calling Adrienne Marie Brown a friend as well as a sister and you know, her work around emergent strategy, I got pulled into when I started, shortly after I started this project. I didn't, I hadn't read the book. I didn't know what emergent strategy was, but we had met the year before and when she found out I was doing this project, she invited me to lead a whale whispering workshop for an emergent strategy immersion that she was doing in New Orleans. And I was like, I don't know what that would look like. I don't know what that means, but she was like, ah, oh, you got it. And so I created something that ended up being like such a really uplifting, healing, transformative experience for everybody present, you know. And it was from that that I understood like this is a this is a tool that I can share in ways that go beyond because I was originally just thinking of this project as something with a creative outcome, you know, something where I was going to create these songs and make this recording, make this album, have a documentary film about it. And then, you know, like have this performance at sea that people could witness that would be recorded. And from that, I began to understand it so much more. And she talks about fractals a lot in her work. And 
I, I tuned into the fractal nature of this work, you know, because it just began to reveal more and more and more layers of what it is. And so my focus has shifted. I mean, there's definitely the creative work and the creative outcomes as well. But now I also know that this is something to be shared in community, you know, and something to be engaged collectively um, in nature, you know, at bodies of water. That's definitely one of the directives of the whales is to gather people together around bodies of water to sing to the waters for the healing of the waters. So the whales have given you directives. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what else have they said? What else, what else can you share with us? Well, the first thing, the first message that I received from them um, was that we must get off the oil. When I came for the first time to work on the project and directly asked the question of them, what do you have to say to me? What do you want me to share? I was walking along the beach here, just a pristine beach, just miles of beach with nothing and no one. And um, I sent this message out telepathically to them asking this question. And immediately the answer came back, get off the oil. That's the way the response came. And literally that message came into my mind and I looked up and I saw ahead of me on the beach, I wrote about this in my blog, I think, maybe like 50 feet ahead, I saw these two green dots. And as I got closer, the first one, they were like maybe 10, 15 feet apart. As I got up on the first one, I saw that it was a bottle, it was a plastic bottle of motor oil. Uh from, you know, that obviously somebody had thrown off a boat for a boat motor or they had, you know, fallen off and washed on shore. So it was two of these bottles of motor oil, literally on the beach and nothing else on the beach. <laughs> the whale said, get off the oil. And these two bottles, these two empty bottles of motor oil were suddenly in front of me littering the beach, you know. Um, and so... That's definitely something, you know, that everybody working on the environment understands as central. But the way I have understood it to be part of my focus specifically for this project is I have the intention of, um, I really have a strong desire to get into relationship with a company or some companies that are producing um boat motors that don't run on oil, that, you know, greatly reduce the noise pollution that motors put into the ocean. So that um, I would like to spark a movement of, at the very least, any boat that's going out on a whale watching mission or an interaction with whales is um, not producing that kind of pollution of noise and oil and for it to spread out from there. Um, they gave me the directive of gathering people together to sing to and with the waters and of bringing, you know, being one of the people to support bringing their songs above the surface of the water, you know, to share this, this healing sound with as many people as possible, like bringing, bringing that sound above the water. So in gathering people together to sing to the water, there's also always a component of whale song being played and being present uh, when we come together. Wow, you've done that already? Yeah, so after I did the emergent strategy immersion, um, I understood that this was an integral part of this work, you know, so... Um, once things started to open up a little bit more after the pandemic last year, I began doing these gatherings. I've done three in New Orleans so far, one um, by the Bayou in City Park, one at the Mississippi River, and one at Lake Pontchartrain, which ultimately opens up into the Gulf of Mexico. And then I did one 
um, on the Hudson River in New York City at the confluence in the Bay at the confluence of the Hudson and the Atlantic and I did one in um, North Carolina um, on a former plantation site um, and they've all been extremely powerful yes and those are such key areas my my um my mother was raised right off of the mississippi river mm-hmm. in the south and the mississippi is, is so integral to our experience as africans on american soil yes so definitely you have to come to michigan because we have plenty of water here <laughs> through the water we can trans we can transmit healing energy because it flows throughout the earth so definitely, if you ever want to plan something for for Michigan, I am totally down. I would love to to um, to, to to support you on making that happen. I would love to. Do. I would love to come there. I mean, you know, think about Flint in particular and the mm-hmm. challenges that they've been having with their water supply there. And I think of it, you know, what I witness is that people tap into because. It's, it's that we're all water, right? You know, we're all made of water. Yeah, and we're so, se- over 70% water. Yes, yeah, so there's something empowering water. about coming together and tapping into that intention with the water and understanding that, yes, we can shift things. There's so many different ways that we can use our energy, that we can use our intention to shift things. Um, so, yeah, I would love to I would love to come up to Michigan for sure. Oh, wonderful. So, okay, well, so we'll have to stay in touch and coordinate that. Okay, definitely. That. In, the summer, always... cause, in the summer, because, you know, it's <laughs> Let me clarify. You gotta, you gotta put that caveat in <laughs> there. You will not find me up there in January <laughs> singing to the ice. I mean, yes. it's absolutely necessary, yeah, but preferably in the summer. Yeah, summer is definitely better because we, you know, we would get more people to come out. You know, although the ice can be really beautiful, it makes a really beautiful sound. Ice is moves. so powerful too. But I, and especially if you're in Bahia, you know what? I was I spent some time in Brazil, and I didn't make it to Bahia, but that is definitely a place that I would like to go. I was actually in Atibaia, which is outside of São Paulo. Uh huh. I know that there are there still a lot of um, people of African descent in Bahia. I, yes, there are. <laughs> How are you finding your life in Brazil? I I, I know that Bahia has um, well, I know Brazil has a, a number of really powerful religions and, and and spiritual practices, and that Bahia is a place where um, people of African descent were able to hold on to some of the African spiritual traditions, and so. What drew you to Bahia, and, and how are you finding your time there? Well, I'm. A, this is uh, my 28th year of coming to Bahia and being in relationship with Bahia. Um, I am initiated in Candomblé, which is one of the, um, they call them religions with um, African, I don't know how to translate, like, with Afri- African matrices. Um, so, you know, with the root in Africa and to connect with this practice and with this tradition, which is very much nature-based. You know, I was called through my connection to the ocean. I'm a daughter of Yemanja and a child of the waters and um, being in an environment where Everyone, even people who don't practice candomblé because the culture is so pervasive here, everyone has an understanding, a relationship to spirit being present in more ways than meet the physical eye. You know, everyone there, I mean, there's just the culture is imbued with a way of relating that engages spiritual knowing. And I mean, people 
it's it's challenging to articulate, but like people, I feel very seen here, you know, as someone who is very spiritual, who has, you know, a very active dream reality and telepathic reality and People see me, people see you, you know, there's a way of looking into people and looking at the world that is the perspective of a culture that is not strictly defined by this dissection and um, separation that Western society attempts to impose on our mentalities, you know, this colonization that suggests that we're separate from the natural world and that spirit is something that we can only access through an institution or the Bible or, you know, something that is not In embodied. Building. You yes. Know. So... It's been wonderful for me. I mean, it has everything to do with who I am. You know, I started coming here as a very young woman. I was I was 23 the first time I arrived here. And so it's, you know, I'm about to be 52. So it has definitely informed so much of who I am as as a woman, as a black woman moving through this world having having Bahia as part of my foundation. And I know it's an ancestral connection. You know, this is not like I definitely have blood connection to this place. You know, this is ancestral all the way. So it's been like finding a part of myself that I didn't know I was missing until I came here for the first time. I know that there were a number of Africans from Angola who were brought to um, Brazil. I'm sure there are other countries where Africans came well, from? The branch of the tradition that I um, am initiated in is actually the Yoruba. Um, the Yoruba based tradition, the Ketu um, branch of the tradition. There is Candomblé Angola here in Brazil and also Jeji, which is more rooted in the Ewe Fon um, ethnic spiritual practice. Eve and Fawn are more Benin, Togo, Ghana. Okay. Yeah, so that whole like bite of Benin is where the majority of folks came from during a certain phase of um, colonization and enslavement in Brazil. And there was another phase, a later phase, when more people were coming from the Congo, Angola region. So, um, a very, very strong Yoruba influence um, in Bahia in particular, but definitely also many elements of, of Angola and Congo culture as well. My bachelor's is in international um, relations and mm -hmm. my master's is in Africana studies. When you look at Africa, obviously you've, you've been, you felt connected to Africa since you started to study Africa and now you're living in a place where the influence of Africa is, is, is strong, or at least part of the year you're living in a place where the African influence is strong. How do you say this has changed your idea of the divine feminine? If you were to define what the divine looks like in the feminine aspect, how would you say that? I mean, the easiest answer would be obviously a black woman. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> seems so obvious to me, especially being in Bahia because, you know, it's a place where the divine feminine is very celebrated and where black womanhood is very celebrated and candomblé is a tradition founded by black women literally 
where the spiritual leadership is centered in black womanhood. And so this is like, you know, the land of the divine feminine. I mean, the celebration for Yemanja, which happens February 2nd every year, is literally a day when hundreds of thousands of people drop everything to go make offerings at the sea to the Divine Mother, you know? Wow. Um, so I'm smack dab in the middle of it, you know? And again, when I say that it has everything to do with who I am as a woman, how I move through the world, how I understand myself, that's what I'm talking about. Like that acknowledgement of the Divine Feminine, that celebration of the Divine Feminine, that... Um, unapologetic and non-negotiable understanding that the divine feminine is at the core, you know, of all existence and patriarchy be damned is what is keeping this whole ship running, you know, um, that has everything to do with my relationship to this place and to my understanding of myself as a person of African descent in the world. I did have the opportunity to live in Kenya as an undergrad student. I did study abroad in Kenya and I was there when I received the call to come here. So, you know, it's all in the flow. I can see now at, at midlife, you know, that everything that I've experienced up to this point has been you know, pouring in to this understanding that I have now. But, you know, it goes back to my family lineage, you know, of coming from a matriarchy. Like, I grew up very close to my grandmother, um, who was from North Carolina, and who was not a part of any organized African spiritual practice, but definitely had many, many um, strong ties to hoodoo and traces of African spiritual tradition that have been held on to in forms, in cultural practices um, that don't look like an organized tradition such as Candomblé or Santeria, but are definitely rooted in, you know, these, these African spiritual practices. All What's of an which, example of what your grandmother may have done culturally that was reminiscent of African spiritual practices? Um, working roots, you know, paying very close attention to dreams and the symbolism of, of dreams. Like, we, she's the person who really, like, she saw that I had vision. And she supported and encouraged the growth and the development of that vision by always asking me what I saw and what I felt. She asked me what I dreamed. She asked me, she would ask me what I felt about certain people. And she liked to gamble. So she always wanted to know like if any numbers were coming to me. I spent a lot of time at the racetrack as a child, picking winning horses. I had lots of money as a child because she would always give me some money when the horses I picked hit. But this was also a way of training that gift, you know, um, and engaging it and understanding that the world was much more than what was in front of your eyes, you know. Um, I love that. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, my mother was into dreams, too. She always talked about her dreams, and she was, I think that's the car row. I think that's the so-and-so row, and I need to play the number. And Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was very much, very much a common, common conversation. Mm-hmm for my mother as well. So, so yeah, I mean, and it's, it's like, it wasn't really thought of as some title, like this is an intuitive sense or, you know, it was just, it was just a, it was a kind of a common place and that everybody kind of understood that this is kind of, this is the way we do things. Exactly. Just, just like I saw a spirit as a child my mother said, oh, don't worry. That's just Aunt Bert. She's just coming back to check on us. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop, stop. 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 Mm. Mm. 
Okay. My fatty boy, boom, boom. That's my grandmother's name. Really? Mm -hmm. Alberta. Yeah, we called her Birdie. Albert. Wow. Yeah, my great aunt, her name was Roberta. Oh. Wow. And she's always present with me. <laughs> Obviously. Wow, okay. So what just All happened? Right. What did you what, what did you feel? I just felt her coming through, you know, like <laughs> You said, oh, don't worry. That's just Aunt Bert coming to check on us. <laughs> and it was like my grandmother saying, I'm here, you know, checking on you, checking in, um, which she always is, you know. But Bert is such a specific name for a woman. <laughs> you know, like it's literally probably one in about three million chance that that would be the name that would come out of your mouth for anybody you would reference, you know? So I just, I just really felt very overcome with, um, the, the affirmation and the confirmation in, in you speaking that name as we were talking about her, mm -hmm. as we were talking about her. Wow. Wow, I'm so glad to to have been a part of that. Yeah, you know your voice. You just all of a sudden you stopped, and your your face was, you know, just welling up with emotion, and and I just I felt like I, I couldn't move, I had to be still, and I it's, it's a wonderful thing. I, I I feel very much very close to my ancestors, and I just call their names like yes. matter of factly. <laughs> I'm still in relationship. <laughs> I'm in I'm in a closer relationship now since the pandemic than I ever was. So, yeah, I'm definitely, my ancestors just kind of, they just kind of roll off my tongue. Yeah, <laughs> well, just, you're I, clearly a medium, clearly. <laughs> yes, that's just, you mentioned that how important it is for us, for you and for all of us to do the work of um, sending healing energy to the ocean and communicating with the wells and bringing people together to sing. What is it about this time that you feel is most significant? There's so many things happening. I mean, one of them on the subject of ancestors, you know, is that we're inside of this reckoning, right, around the legacy of enslavement and white supremacy and colonization. And the ancestors are speaking, the ancestors are rising, you know. And so part of this whale work is also ancestor work because the whales carry this memory of the Middle Passage, you know, they have this ancestral memory. And speaking of the blues, bringing it back around to the blues, you know, the understanding that I've been given through this is that whale song is like a missing link in what we understand to be the blues. Because the Africans who made that journey of the Middle Passage, they heard the whale singing, you know, and there was this musical exchange that happened between the whales and those those Africans. And so they brought whale song into their vocal expressions and vice versa. And so... What's an example of that? Can you... Oh, the... I mean, if you listen to whales, they wail, you know? They wail, they moan. And... So we know the connection to West Africa, to, you know, the griot traditions, Mali, Senegal, that kind of, you know, those, those scales, we can trace that directly in, in terms of the blues we get out of Mississippi and, and the Delta and all that. But there's something about whale song that is a mournful, moaning, extended way of vocalizing that is very resonant with the blues and i'm certain is true uh an integral part of what those africans brought ashore with them 
after so making true. that journey. Wow, that, I love the way you put that together with the well song and the blues and and when you mentioned Molly, I you know I have I have a connection to Molly. Wow, that's 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 deep. That's deep. Yeah. So in terms of what's happening right now, you know, part of it is going back and getting what the ancestors left. You know, in terms of because my question to them is how did you survive that you know there were many who didn't survive but even surviving a day even survive you know what i'm saying like how did you make that journey how did you get to this side of those waters you know yeah how did you know it just i just i, I just want to just interject this we are descended from some of the st- strongest most resilient people the fact that you and i are sitting here talking about our ancestors from the south and and who are connected to africa it, you know it, in this philosophical way with the with the privilege of being able to to talk means that our ancestors are some of the most powerful strong yes. people that ever lived yes. so yes i am like yes Yes. How did they do that? And, and not only do that, but then be able to show up in us now to help us understand part of what actually happened. What, what actually had to happen in order for us, the two of us, descended from African people, to be sitting here and having this kind of conversation, it's just miraculous. So, yes. It is miraculous. Have you heard anything about what, what did they do? How did they make it? Do you, have you heard anything in, intuitively? Oh, yeah. I mean, so what's happening, what I'm doing with the whale songs is that I'm I'm hearing, like, so as I said, there was this exchange, right? So the Africans brought whale songs to shore with them, and the, and the whales stored in their songs, in their memory, the sounds that they heard from the ships. Oh. The moaning, the wailing, the singing, the crying that they heard coming from the ships they held that story, you know? And so that's a central part of of what I'm doing with the whales now is going in and getting those, those like voice messages, voicemails from the ancestors, you know, about that journey and singing their way over. And that's what they told me is that they sang their way through, you know? Um, So one of the songs that has come through for the project it's like it starts with as long as we keep on breathing and sing our way across this sea as long as we know in our hearts we are the power we will be free so this idea that like we, using our voices is an affirmation of our power. Like we're singing to get through this. We're singing to generate this energy, this vibration, and this power that we're tapping into is the divine source. It is what mm-hmm. we are. We're not disconnected from that despite this condition of, of capture of captivity and transience and uncertainty, you know, that we affirm with our voices that we are the power. And that's how we know no matter what our circumstances, there is a way that we can affirm and assert that power and the voice singing collectively, bringing vibration through is one of the most powerful ways to do that. Oh, thank you so much so much for the song I just I I love like I said I love music and I have been I I feel that my voice is a part of what I am to be using as during this time as a part of Ascension so much can be shared through song and for me that is the way that that's like my prayer that's that's like the the best way for me to pray is to sing what would you like to leave us with what thoughts or revelation 
would you most like for us to part with? Well, um, I think that I will give the last word to the whales, which is that we are one. That is the core message that they've given me that is the gist of what they want to communicate, that there is, in truth, only one being, you know? And when I reference that line in the song, before we are the power, when I say the power, that's what I mean, that power, the source, that oneness, that creator, that we are all that. We are all that. that. <laughs> all that, you know? And so to understand ourselves as empowered, to understand ourselves as interconnected, and to understand ourselves as co-creators of this reality that we share, you know, our individual realities, but also the collective reality of everybody living on this planet at this time. And um, really just deepening ever more into embodying that and knowing that and, and living that because that is what moves us off of this path of self-destruction. Um, and yeah, we are one. Which, by the way, I have um, the recording is finally available. There's a, the first recording of me singing underwater with the whales um, is is up on my website now. It's right now available to download, to pay to download as a way of supporting the project. I'm working on getting the um, Zoom event that was the release for that song, for that recording, edited, and that will be up on the website so people can watch that and hear it for free as well if they are not able to pay for the download of it. But there's a audio recording called We Are One where the whale, one of the whales that I'm interacting with is actually forming the words We Are One. He's forming the words? Or she's yeah. forming the words? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Can you give us your website? Because I think I, I definitely want to go back and download. I, when I saw on your website that there was a, a download, I didn't have my um, credit card right with me, but I'm going to make sure now that I go back. And it's only $7. So it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a really great, and it's a really great cause. And when you, and when you put your money toward this project, then you are, are adding positive energy to this whole project and this whole process. So it's it's not just about, you know, I'm I'm giving a couple of dollars and I'm getting something. It's really about um agreeing, touching and agreeing that this song is uplifting and that we are willing to shift our mindset so that we can see ourselves as interconnected and then shift the way we live in the world. Shift the way we live on the earth. So yes. this is this is about touching and agreeing with that that idea that that what we give to ourselves we give to the to the ocean and what the ocean gives to us we we you know that it's interconnected. So yes. what's the website so people can go back and check it? And I'll definitely include it in the show notes. Okay, it's MichaelaHarrison dot org, and there's a whale whispering page on the website. There's a tab for whale whispering on the website, and there's also I think it's called a marketplace, which is where you go to get the download. And with the download, there's like a portal that you go through where you have to kind of read the story behind the audio before you listen to it. So I encourage everybody who goes there to do that because there's there's a setup that is very important to have before you listen to it because the audio, it's, it's 16 and a half minutes and I share it really as a meditation, you know? And so there's a way to enter into that that is preparatory and, and very important to receive it as what it is because it's very it's very strange and magical and, and profound, you know. 
Well, thank you so much for, for making it available to us. And thank you so much, Michaela Harrison, Well Whisperer, Singer Extraordinaire. And what else, what other, so what are some of the other titles that, that you give yourself? Um, I am a priest. I'm a healer. I'm a dreamer. I am a um, prismatic person. I don't like the word queer. So I came up with the word prismatic because it represents the spectrum of colors in the rainbow. Um, I am a writer. I am a lover and a spirit woman. Michaela Harrison, Spirit Woman, thank you so much for joining me on Center Her Power podcast. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. Did I say it was free? It's totally free. You don't have to pay anything to get started. There are creation tools and you can edit and trim the end. You can record. There, there's um, intro music that you can use. It has so many really cool features that I really needed as I was starting to podcast. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM and get started. Go ahead, download, get started. Let your voice be heard. Thank you so much for joining me for In the Center of Her Power podcast. I sincerely hope that you were fed with divine feminine soul food. Please like or subscribe or share the podcast. And until next time, shine.